Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining today for the Nurse Data Seminar. We are uh, very pleased and excited to have Xiao Shang Huang and Andy Gu talking to us today about their work on discovering and modeling strong gravitational lenses, not only because they're using uh, NERSC resources, but that's uh, a cool extra, um, extra feature of this work. Um, and they're doing cool stuff using GigaLens, which is, uh, I guess what I'd call it, a sort of differentiable simulator and uh, some machine learning techniques. So Xiao Sheng um, got his PhD from UC Berkeley. He's now a faculty member at University of San Francisco, uh, works on supernova cosmology project, nearby supernova factory and uh, DESI. And Andy is a senior now at UC Berkeley and has also been working on the supernova cosmology project project and DESI. So uh, they will both be giving the talk. And at this point, I think I'll hand it off to Xiao Sheng. You can get started. Thanks, Steve, for inviting us. I'm excited to um, talk about uh, strong gravitational lensing. Um, and uh, so uh, I, I think uh, given that the audience uh, may not uh, all have physics background, uh, I'll try to um, go through uh, what lensing is uh, at the beginning. Uh, but I also want to make sure that I leave enough time for Andy. So towards the end, uh, I may leave out uh, a few things, but you know, hopefully there, there, there will be a Q&A time. So feel free to ask more about um, uh, those aspects later. And uh, as Steve and Andy and I were talking about earlier, feel free to interrupt anytime. Um, all right, so let me share my screen. Um, okay, hopefully you can see my screen. Um, and uh, so uh, today I will be talking to you about discovering and modeling uh, strong gravitational lenses with Corey and Perlmutter uh, and NERSC. Um, and I will be talking more about the search aspect uh, and Andy uh, will talk more about uh, the lens modeling side of things. All right, um, so first of all, let me uh, acknowledge my collaborators uh, David Schlegel was uh, really the person that got this project started and has been uh, 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 a person that's been uh, sustaining this project uh, uh, going forward. Um, and uh, there are uh, quite a few um, uh, uh, physics division people, uh, as well as people from other institutions. Uh, but I want to uh, give uh, special thanks to Steve Farrell, uh, Lori, um, Steph, Steffi and uh, Roland Thomas, uh, four years ago when we started this project, uh, there were so many things that we didn't know about, uh, uh, um, uh, questions about um, nurse facilities, questions about machine learning, and uh, uh, those three really uh, were um, uh, extremely helpful uh, in um, getting the project off the ground. So thanks. And this is a project that um, has uh, a number of undergraduate students. Uh, in fact, this is uh, almost exclusively an undergraduate student uh, research project. Uh, I've been amazed, uh, uh, astounded by the energy, the imagination, the expertise uh, that they've uh, offered and contributed to this project. Um, and uh, finally, on the lens modeling side, uh, we've added a few uh, more collaborators in recent years. All right, so um, what is gravitational lensing? Well, uh, it is uh, a chance al alignment. It's due to a chance alignment between the observer, a foreground massive galaxy, and a faraway background galaxy. And this happens for about one in 10,000 massive galaxies. And the mass of the foreground galaxy uh, will warp space-time in, in its vicinity and this will cause photons, the, the path of photons to bend. And this will create highly distorted images and sometimes multiple images of the background object. So this is a simulation that is um, generated by one of the team members, uh, William Shu. So these two images correspond to the same uh, object in the background. And, um, 
Uh, here are a few examples of real lensing systems. So this is a doubly lensed system, just like the simulation. And if the alignment is really good, and if the lens uh, mass distribution is uh, reasonably uh, spherically symmetric, you will get what's called an Einstein ring. And what that means is that photons can reach you from the background galaxy in all directions around the lens. Um, now, if the lens has, uh, it, it has some ellipticity, even if the alignment is perfect, you will not get a ring. Instead, you will get four images of the same background object. And this, this is called the Einstein cross. And you will see all three image configurations uh, in the discoveries that I will uh, show you later. Um, lensing, strong lensing, it turns out, is a powerful tool for cosmology. Um, it is the most direct um, test for cold dark matter model beyond the local universe. Um, and uh, so if you want to know how that uh, can actually, uh, how lensing can actually be used as a test, uh, you can ask me about that later. Um, if the background ga galaxy has a transient, meaning something that uh, has a varying brightness, so for example, a quasar or supernova, uh, then the, the two copies of the same event uh, will be offset in time. And we call that offset time delay. If you can measure that time delay and you can accurately model the mass distribution of the lensing galaxy, you will be able to measure directly the expansion rate of the universe or this quantity that, that astrophysicists call H naught or the Hubble constant. And finally, in very rare, uh, there are these uh, very rare systems that have two sources. So these two images correspond to one source, the blue images correspond to another source. In those scenarios, um, these systems can be used to constrain dark energy as pointed out by a recent paper by um, Eric Linder and one of his students. Um, okay, so then how do we find uh, these strong lenses? Well, you need uh, a very wide and deep image uh, survey because these systems are so rare. Um, and the DESI legacy imaging surveys are perfect for this purpose. DESI uh, is a dark energy spectroscopic instrument it's a LBL-led uh, DOE uh, dark energy experiment. And the footprint covers much of the northern sky, as you can see here. And ton terabytes upon terabytes of data are stored and processed at NERSC. And the objects are extracted um, and typed by this algorithm called Tractor, which also runs on NERSC. Um, and uh, let me point out that for such a large survey, uh, if you want to finish that survey in a reasonable amount of time, um, it turns out that you really need more than one telescope. So, so, so these are the three telescopes that uh, did a survey. And in part because of that, uh, the survey is more inhomogeneous than most surveys, than most imaging surveys. So for example, the northern part, which uh, is shown with this green outline, is observed by these two telescopes. Uh, whereas the southern part of the survey, which is observed by the Blanco 4 meter telescope uh, uh, with the uh, red contour. Um, so the southern part has slightly better image quality. And this is something that, uh, that we, we need to uh, 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 think hard about uh, how, when we try to look for lens, lenses. And also you can see that the depth, the observation depth uh, is not uniform. And this is also something that uh, we had to um, think about how to overcome. Um, and so all this processing at NERSC really provided a really good starting point for our search. We first select galaxies that are brighter than 20th magnitude. So for astronomers, um, the smaller the magnitude value, the brighter they are. So we're looking for massive galaxies, and these galaxies tend to be among the brightest. Um, and uh, so uh, we want to find these bright galaxies, which are likely to be massive galaxies. 
Uh, don't worry about these acronyms. These are basically uh, uh, indicating that these are elliptical galaxies. So these are the most massive galaxies in the universe. And uh, um, most, uh, the vast majority of strong lenses uh, are elliptical galaxies. So we focus on this type of galaxies first. Uh, uh, RECs are galaxies, are objects that uh, the tractor recognizes as galaxies, but couldn't tell what type it is. So there's an unknown percentage of these galaxies that are elliptical galaxies. So in total, we wanted to search through 22 million galaxies to find strong lenses. Um, so I think to this audience, uh, it's probably not a surprise that we wanted to use a ResNet to do image recognition. Um, the architecture that we followed uh, is from Lanus et al. 2018. Uh, we translated in the TensorFlow. We do the usual image pre-processing and data augmentation. Um, we use a highly asymmetric uh, training sample, meaning we use about 30 times more non-lenses than lenses in training sample. And the reason for that is because we use observed images to train our neural net. And when we started, there were only several hundred known lenses. Uh, that's one reason. So we are limited by the number of lenses uh, at the time. But the other reason is that there are many uh, different kinds of non-lensing configurations. And we want the ResNet to be exposed to as many of those con configurations as possible. Um, so as I said, uh, I can't remember if I, if I gave you a numerical estimate. So we have about 30 times more non-lenses uh, than lenses in our, in our training sample. Uh, earlier, I mentioned that the observational depth uh, can vary. Uh, so uh, what we found uh, to be uh, really helpful is to maintain the lens to non-lens ratio regardless of the depth. Uh, that, would, uh, that was very helpful in preventing the neural network to be uh, biased one way or the other. Um, we use the cross entropy as the uh, loss function uh, where, where yi is the label and yi hat is the predicted probab prob probability. Um, and uh, we achieve AUC of uh, 0.992. And um, so then we deployed on NERSC and um, so we actually did two searches. The first was conducted on data release seven of the legacy surveys, and we found 335 lens candidates. Uh, and, and DR8, uh, uh, when DR8 was completed, we did another search, and we found four times more new candidates. Uh, here are the candidates that are uh, elliptical galaxies, so we didn't include um, those lenses that are classified as RECs, um, but the, those, but only those that are uh, classified by the tractor as elliptical galaxies. Um, and so I mentioned earlier that image quality is a little bit better in the southern part of the survey, uh, and all of our training images are taken from this part of the survey both lenses and the non-lenses. So uh, our performance in this part uh, is, is, um, is, is really uh, a sort of a fair metric to see how um, the, neural net, the neural network is doing. Um, so unlike for terrestrial um, image recognitions, I I image recognition tasks, um, to find lenses, uh, we cannot rely on the ResNet entirely human inspection is still needed. Um, it turns out that for our uh, algorithm, about 30, uh, one in 30 of the images that are above the neural network uh, threshold is, re is um, classified by, by a human as a lens candidate. Uh, so one in 30 is about as good as anyone can reach these days. Uh, this may be uh, you know, one of the best, if not the best efficiency. Since we did so well, we thought, why not apply our uh, neural network, train neural network to the northern part of the survey? Uh, so we did this without retraining the neural network. And uh, the efficiency drops a little bit, but not too badly. Uh, we still get one in 45. Um, and uh, finally, um, 
one of the team members, Andy Gu, from uh, whom you will hear more later in this talk, uh, modified the original ResNet that we used a little bit by adding um, what he calls shielding layers, which are basically one by one um, uh, convolution layers that compresses uh, the output, uh, the, the number of output channels. Um, and that this reduces the number of training parameters, uh, reduces training time. And uh, surprisingly, uh, this modification, mild as it is, uh, added one third more uh, lens candidates. Uh, so neural network uh, model comparison uh, is something that we, we thought about doing uh, but we haven't um, kind of uh, done this in a systematic way. But this is just a, a, an interesting uh, early result that we found. Um, so, so in total, we've discovered over 1,600 lens candidates. Uh, and uh, those that are found in the second paper are broken down uh, by the two models that we used, by grades, by the type, so DC stands for dev or comp, which, as I said, are basically elliptical galaxies, um, and by uh, regions, the decals is the southern part, um, and the MZLS is the northern part. Um, Shane, I think we have a question from Shane. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, just I wanted to make sure I was following this, like one in 30 and one in 45. So are these false positives, or are these cases where it's leaving it's leaving out a candidate that should have been included yeah that's a really good question uh no doubt some of these are false positives uh we found for example uh there there's a type of uh, astronomical objects called ring galaxies and uh, uh um you know we kind of gradually got a little bit better in uh, in terms of our ability to tell when um you know you know whether an object is a ring galaxy versus you know, a, a lens Einstein ring. Uh, but in other cases, it's the evidence is just not enough. So we basically want to maintain, you know, a certain level of sort of candidate quality. So there are systems that we have a suspicion for that this may be a lens, but just using ground-based images, there just isn't enough um, evidence for us to be confident. And I'll show you examples of, 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 of that kind of, uh, 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 kind of uh, hard cases later on. Sorry. Go ahead. Even a human has a hard time in those cases? Yes, yes. Yeah. So this, okay. yeah, this is because uh, ground-based observations have inherent limitations. Yeah. And then the other question I had was, you know, if it's um, leaving candidates out that should have been, is there any possibility that this could introduce any kind of biases that you might you know, draw conclusions from? Yeah, yeah. So uh, if, if we want to do a population level study, then I would say that at this point, the selection function is not absolutely clear. Okay. Um, that's a great question. And, and there is a way to address that and we're working towards that. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, but I, I also want to say that lenses are so rare that each individual system is, is worth studying in itself. You know, even if at the population level, we don't understand uh, what's, what gets left out, what gets left out, or what, what is kept in. All right. Um, so let's look at some of the discoveries. Uh, so these are from our first, oh, first of all, all of our candidates are uh, on our website. And uh, the vast majority are galaxy scale lenses, and you will see what I mean by that in just a minute. Uh, it's not a surprise because um, our training sample mostly consists of galaxy scale lenses. About 10% also are group and cluster scale lenses. Uh, and then uh, about a dozen or so are lens quasars, which uh, we deliberately excluded from, from our training sample. So it's good to see that we can find these systems. All right, so this is, from, this is from our first paper, and the first column shows two near Einstein rings, as you can see. And this one shows an Einstein cross, those four images. And this one, uh, I would still call this one a quad because you got one, two, and then these, this arc is the merging of two images. 
this is a classic image counter image configuration. So is this one, an image and a counter image. Uh, what's interesting about the last two is that, as you can see, the lens really consists of two galaxies. As I said, we didn't have too many of those in our training sample. So it was good to see that we can find those. And don't worry about these numbers. We'll come back to this towards the end of my part of the talk. Uh, this is the uh, some of the systems that we found from uh, our second search. Uh, here are these big arcs. And this arc, you can see a counter arc here. And this is a near Einstein ring. Uh, these are doubly lens systems. I'm pointing at the two lensed images. Um, and then these are the quads. Uh, this is faint, but if you look at it, there really are four images. There are four images, and there are four images. And then this is, again, a very uh, a near perfect Einstein cross. Um, and I'll quickly go through these cluster lenses. These are very interesting, huge arcs, uh, much larger, uh, a factor of 10 larger than the galaxy scale arcs. So when I say group or cluster scale lenses, what I mean is that the lens consists of multiple galaxies. Uh, in this case, it's a group. In this case, it's a cluster. So cluster is basically a very large group. Uh, and you can see these arcs. There's a very thin arc here. There's an arc here. And this is one of our best systems. It's another group lensing scenario, but it has four distinct sources. They're labeled one. So one has four images and two has this long arc kind of broken in the middle, uh, three in the middle here, and then four, this giant red arc uh, out of here. Um, and so remember multiple source uh, lensing systems uh, can be used to constrain dark energy. Um, okay, uh, so you, we, sorry yeah. to interrupt. Can I ask how do you disentangle those things to know like ah these three go together, those two definitely go. Do you use like simulation? Yeah. Very good question. So one uh, one quick way is color. So gravitational lensing, unlike optical lens, is achromatic. So it does not change color. So for example, these four images, just visually, you can tell that they have very similar color. Whereas this one's a little reddish, this one's clearly a different color. Um, and the also geometry. So you can see that the aspect ratio of this and the color are more consistent compared with these four images. Um, but I tell you that, you know, uh, when a new student joins uh, the group, that's one of the first things that we do, which is uh, kind of train them to recognize lenses. Um, yeah, great question. Thanks. Um, so we thought, oh, you know, we, we found a number of very interesting systems. So we propose to observe these systems on the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, on the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, our proposal was accepted. Uh, we uh, requested uh, an infrared band uh, to complement the optical observation from the ground. Uh, in total, 51 systems were observed. And uh, every single one has been confirmed as an actual lensing system. And so now let me show you. Uh, so these are uh, half of the system, uh, 26 of the 51. And these are, uh, these are systems that primarily have a single galaxy as the main lens, as you can see. And some of them, just by looking at it, it's actually very hard to tell. So for example, this one, you look at it, you go, is that really a lens? And we, we thought we were confident enough to send this to Hubble and you will see what Hubble has, what, what has Hubble found. So let me now uh, go to the Hubble images. So here you can see that these arcs are really uh, very clear um, uh, gravitationally lensed. You can see the Einstein cross here, another quadruply lensed system another quadruple lens system and so forth. So this one was the one that, you know, when May legitimately asked the question, is that really lensing? It turns out that we were right. Um, and um, so let me, just for the fun of it, let me kind of blink a little bit. Um, and uh, so, so the Einstein radius is something that Andy will talk more about. So it's basically the average distance between the arcs. Let me use that HST image. Uh, the, average is the average distance between the arc and the lens. Um, and uh, the other half of the systems are group or uh, cluster 
uh, lenses. So here you clearly see there's a group of galaxies. Uh, this one's a very interesting one. Um, again, you can probably legitimately ask, you know, is that really an arc? Um, well, let's take a look at what uh, it is. It is really arc. You can see actually other arcs. It's actually a very interesting complex system. So is this one. You can see there's basically little arcs everywhere. Um, I really like this one. If you look carefully, it's a spiral galaxy with a bulge and with spiral arms. And you can see it because it's highly magnified by gravitational lensing. Um, you can see the spiral arm is sticking out. Um, so again, uh, you know, I can I can look at these for a long time, but uh, in the interest of time, let me just blink back and forth. Uh, you can see that all of these are so. You know, this is almost complete Einstein ring. Uh, this is almost a full ring, more like an egg-shaped ring. All right, uh, moving on. Um, so we did it again because Desi did it again. So Desi kept applying their powerful image processing pipeline using NERSC resources. Uh, this time they went beyond the Desi spectroscopic footprint uh, to uh, deck more negative than minus 18. So we follow suit and we did a search. So this is actually an existing survey called the Dark Energy Survey. And what's interesting about this search is that this part of the sky has been mined by other research groups for strong lenses already. Uh, but when we did it, we found thousands more galaxies, uh, sorry, thousands more strong lenses. So as I said, I, I think that uh, um, you know, machine learning technique comparisons could be interesting. Um, and so basically we've doubled the number of lenses uh, compared to our first two papers. And one of the team members, Christopher, is writing up the results. Here are three of the new lenses that we found. This is a clear double. This is probably lens quasar. You can barely see uh, the lensing galaxy, the red little um, few pixels down the middle. Quasars can be very bright. This is a giant arc and a counter arc produced by a group. Um, in the interest of time, uh, let me just uh, quickly walk you through uh, some of the new candidates. So these are all doubles, as you can see. Uh, the quads, it's not always obvious. Here you see four red images. Here you see four images. Um, you can ask me more if you want. So here are clusters. This is an arc. That's an arc. Um, and this arc is interesting because in the middle, it's lensed again by this galaxy. So now it's got four images. And then finally, the last row are all high redshift. So very far away lens, and not only are the sources far away, but the lenses themselves are far away. And you can tell by the deep red color of these galaxies in the middle. And each system is really nice. So this is a quadruply lens system. This is another quadruply lens system. This one has a giant arc and a counter arc. Um, so you, you get the picture. Um, I, I also want to say that uh, we continue to work with uh, Desi. Uh, they've, um, uh, if Desi, if you don't know, is this powerful instrument, this amazing instrument that can measure the spectra of 5,000 galaxies with one pointing using fiber optics. And so they've generously offered to observe our lensing systems. So why do we want to get spectra? Well, spectra, for one thing, spectra tells you, spectra tell you uh, what's called redshift. So it's basically a measure of distance. So one way to tell whether a suspected lensing system is actually a lensing system is that the lens is closer and what you suspect to be a source is further away and typically much further away. Uh, so the typical ratio of the red, the redshift for the source versus the redshift of the deflector, CD, or the lens is a factor of two. And uh, so uh, let me just show you one example. This is very interesting. So this system already is confirmed by uh, our Hubble data, but uh, DESI has gotten the redshift for the lens, what we suspect to be lens, it's, it's at a relatively low 0.25. And then we also targeted these two arc looking objects. Not only are they much further away than uh, this object, but they are at the same distance. And not only that, but this emission feature are identical for these two objects. So in combination, the redshifts of this guy being lower than these two and these two redshifts being exactly the same 
they have the same spectra and they have a high resolution image that shows you the features that correspond to each other. For example, this knot and that knot, this little feature, this little feature. This is the most solid evidence you can get to confirm a lensing system. So it's really great. And all the spectroscopic reduction is done on NERSC. And even the visual uh, inspection tool called the Prospect is run on uh, NERSC Jupyter Hub. Um, and uh, so, and Desi even offered to observe system that has not yet been uh, observed by Hubble. And so these are a subset of systems that have been confirmed spectroscopically as strong lenses. You see a nice arc here. You see almost Einstein radius, Einstein ring here. So with all these uh, data coming in, uh, we would want a reliable and scalable and fast uh, modeling tool uh, to extract uh, science, to reach our science goals. And so here I will hand it over to Andy about lens modeling. Perfect. Um, sorry, Shashan, can I steal the screen? Okay. Perfect. Can you guys see the presentation? Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Okay. Um, thank you, Xiaosheng, and thank you everyone for having us. I'm really honored to have been invited to give this talk. So in my segment of the talk, I'm going to be talking about our new um, fast differentiable Bayesian lens modeling framework, um, which we've called GigaLens. Okay. So before I start talking about our tool, um, I think it's important to kind of walk through some very basic um, modeling theory. Um, so the primary um, lensing equation or the, the central lensing equation is expressing actually a very simple geometric fact that I've illustrated in um, the following diagram. Um, so here the, sorry, let me see if I can get my cursor. Yeah, um, so here the S marks the source and the disc marks a lens and O marks the observer. And theta is the angle at which the observer um, sees the image. Um, and alpha is kind of this quantity known as the deflection angle because it essentially measures how much the light from the source is bent by the lens. Um, so for different types of galaxies, the functional form of alpha can actually differ depending on the mass distribution of the lens. Um, it turns out that dark matter consists of around 80% of the mass in a galaxy. So that's why, as Xiaosheng mentioned before, um, modern lenses can help us understand uh, dark matter better. Um, probably the simplest um, archetypal lens model um, is known as the singular isothermal sphere, where you basically assume that the stars inside the galaxy can be described as um, free atoms in a gas of uniform temperature. So for systems um, belonging to this class of lens, the deflection angle is actually analytically expressible in a very simple form. It's actually just a constant. And this constant is known as the Einstein radius. So it's a parameter that depends on both the mass and the redshift of the lens. And you know, as Xiaosheng mentioned before, the reason it's called a radius is that if a source is perfectly behind the lens, um, the image that is formed will have a radius exactly equal to the Einstein radius. Um, so even for more complicated lens models, there's still typically an Einstein radius parameter for which the intuition is roughly the same. It basically measures the typical radius of the images produced by the lens. And I've shown on this slide here an example of a simulated lens and marked with the arrow um, roughly what the Einstein radius of that lens um, corresponds to. So our problem here is actually fairly typical. Um, we do not have access to the ground truth parameters of the lens. Um, we only have the observable, which is typically just a noisy image of the lensing system. And to move towards the science goals that we mentioned before, um, so for example, dark matter testing, a Hubble constant inference, we need the ability to do several things. Um, so using the observed image, we mainly want to learn about the light profile of the source galaxy, uh, the distribution of matter in the lensing galaxy, um, and potentially even dark matter halos sitting near the lens or along the line of sight. So line of sight meaning um, it's, it's between the observer and the source. Um, so in the, limit, in the language of Bayesian statistics, what we have here is essentially an inference problem um, then, of course, as you might imagine, we will be making extensive use of the Bayes equation, uh, which essentially uh, expresses the posterior distribution 
as a product of the likelihood and prior. Um, I just want to note, uh, you might catch me calling this inference problem um, a modeling problem, but note that they refer to the same thing. Um, so I'm going to describe here basically a high level strategy um, for how we're going to tackle this inference problem. Um, the first thing that we need to do is to write down a model for the physics. Um, this includes a functional form for the source and the lens light, as well as the lens mass. So this mass model is always translated into a deflection angle, which is what we actually use in practice during the modeling. Um, so the next step is to write down a model for the probability. Um, that really means we need to define a prior for the parameters and the likelihood. Uh, sorry, we need to define a prior for the parameters as well as a likelihood function. Um, the likelihood typically assumes that the noise at each pixel in the image is Gaussian. So the log likelihood really looks like a squared error or essentially just the chi-squared up to a multiplicative factor. Um, speaking heuristically, um, all we're trying to do is to match the simulated image to the observed image. And the matching is again, measured by the squared error. All the Bayesian formalism does is to make this rigorous and to characterize an uncertainty for the parameters. Um, so once we've written down this physical and probabilistic model, we're basically ready to sample from the posterior. Um, simple sounding enough. Um, but when we actually start thinking about how to sample, we're faced with a number of problems. The central one is that most regions of a high dimensional parameter space um, has vanishing likelihood. So if we use some sort of out of the box sampler, um, out of the box Monte Carlo sampler like MCMC, we're likely to waste a lot of time in regions of the parameter space that we should not really be looking at because they have vanishing likelihood. So our solution, which is an approach, uh, which was an approach first introduced to us by an open source lens package known as Lenstronomy, um, is we're essentially going to look for the global maximum of the posterior density. And if we can find that, then and the posterior is unimodal in the sense that all the other modes of the posterior have vanishing likelihood. Um, we can just initialize our sampler at this point of high posterior density, and it will do much better. Um, well, the problem with this basic procedure is that it leads to another problem, which is that the parameter space is highly non-convex and therefore is also hard to search over. Um, so the, the figure I've included on this slide shows a simple problem, which is that when you have a non-convex loss landscape, which in our case, the loss landscape is the posterior density, depending on your starting point, you may end up with different solutions um, that differ in quality. So with our goals and the problems from the last slide in mind, we had three main desideratum uh, when making a new lensing package. So first, we required fast simulation. So as we hinted at, simulation is a key to forward modeling. Um, so if we want a fast inference code, we need a fast simulation code. Um, luckily, most popular lens models are actually analytic. So more specifically, their deflection angles can be calculated through a series of very simple matrix operations. Um, so this is what I mean when I say the lens models are linear algebraic. Um, since this is the case, we can actually use GPUs for fast simulation because we know that GPUs are exceptionally good at elementary operations on large matrices. So the next thing we need to do is we need some way to guide us through high dimensional parameter spaces. Um, we'll make the case that without some guide, um, so these methods are known as zeroth order methods, modeling can be very inefficient. So for instance, Lenstronomy uses zeroth order methods and we found this to be an issue um, for the primary reason that there's virtually no performance guarantees with these methods. Um, so for us, we make our guide a local one, um, specifically the gradient. Um, this is particularly fitting because as I mentioned previously, lens models are analytic, uh, hence differentiable. So therefore we can easily access the gradient via automatic differentiation, which is now a technology that's widely available in many linear algebra libraries. So finally, we want a robust framework. Um, what this means is that it produces consistent results across different runs. So it does not fail often and it doesn't require careful tuning of the initialization. So our approach to this is simple. We basically hedge our bets. Um, that is as a general design principle, um, we use many, many candidate solutions so that the failure probability um, vanishes geometrically with the number of candidates we use. So I'll elaborate further on this in coming slides. Um, but um, to maintain numerous candidate solutions, we'll use parallel computation with GPUs. So we developed our framework known as GigaLens, um, which is an abbreviation for a gradient informed and GPU accelerated lens modeling framework. We wrote this with the three desideratum from the last slide in mind. Um, and as some of you may have realized, the popular library TensorFlow is a good choice for most of the features that we wanted. So our code is fully vectorized 
fully differentiable um, using TensorFlow's Autodiff technology. And it also runs natively on GPUs. But furthermore, we've also written a parallel branch using JAX that has further support for distributed computing using multiple GPUs. So we should note that we also make um, extensive use of the TensorFlow probability library as kind of a substrate for many of the Bayesian inference tasks we do in our modeling procedure. Okay, so now that we've established um, or written down um, a simulation code, it basically remains to actually apply it and uh, start modeling. So as I mentioned before, our strategy is to first identify the global maximum of the posterior density. And then we use this to inform how we initialize our sampler. Um, so we do this with multi-starts gradient descent. Um, and what this means is that we initialize many candidate solutions by sampling from our prior, which ought to be broad enough to include the global maximum. Um, next, we use a bijector to unconstrain the various parameters in our lens model. Um, so for instance, uh, take the Einstein radius. So clearly it must always be positive because it's a length. Um, However, it's undesirable to like manually put this constraint into the gradient descent with some sort of like hard wall. Um, so therefore we use bijectors that map parameters into an unconstrained space. Um, so for Einstein radius, we take the log and optimize over that. Um, for a different parameter known as the mass slope, um, which basically measures how fast the mass distribution is changing uh, at the Einstein radius, roughly speaking. Um, so from a physical argument, we know that it always sits between one and three. Um, and since we know a sigmoid maps the real line to a bounded interval, we can use the inverse sigmoid to unconstrain the slope gamma. Um, so the next thing we do is locally optimize each candidate solution using gradient descent uh, with respect to the posterior density. So I want to emphasize we're doing this optimization in parallel over every single candidate solution. Um, and we typically use Atom with an annealed learning rate as is typical for um, non-convex optimization problems. Um, so finally, after a fixed number of iterations, we stop and select the best performing solution and use this as the MAPS mode. So how well does this perform in practice? Um, let's look at an example system. Uh, on the left, I've shown the trajectory of each parameter um, or of, of two primary parameters, uh, one being Einstein radius and one being the mass slope. Um, so specifically, I'm showing the error with respect to the ground truth of each parameter as a function of the, uh, the gradient descent iteration. Um, so the solutions highlighted converge the correct solutions, uh, so the ones in bold. Um, and we've marked in red boxes basically the, the error for the two key parameters. Um, so note that the failure probability of each particle is here roughly 96%. Uh, in the test we actually did for our paper, um, we found 98% uh, upper bound on the failure probability. But for 300 particles, that actually results in success. So success meaning identifying the global maximum. Um, it results in success being virtually certain. Um, on the right, we show the loss trajectory for the best performing six particles. Um, or the six uh, best performing six solutions. Uh, we see that by the 300th iteration, the particles seem to have come into the neighborhood of the optimum because after this, they exhibit a geometric convergence, which is characteristic of loss trajectories in convex regions of the loss function. Um, so that's, this actually informs our cutoff iteration for the gradient descent. Okay, um, so with the MAP estimate, uh, before sampling, we still have one more important auxiliary step. Um, we want to estimate the covariance, which will actually be important later. Um, but the way that we do this is we estimate it using variational inference. So this uh, procedure of variational inference is essentially one where you fit an ansatz distribution, uh, which we call our surrogate posterior, to the true posterior. So as indicated on the diagram, um, say our posterior is kind of like a funny object like the one in blue, um, for which it's hard to get an analytic expression. Um, if we want a rough characterization of it, we might use a simpler analytic distribution and try to fit this to the ground truth or the, the true posterior. Um, and the fit here is measured by the KL divergence between the two distributions. So for us, since we want the covariance, we'll make the surrogate a multivariate normal. Um, and you know, later I'll touch on whether or not this is a reasonable approximation. Um, but with this, we can run VI by optimizing the KL as the function of the mean and the covariance. So the KL up to an additive constant can be written as something known as the evidence lower bound called the elbow. Uh, this is expressed as an expectation over the surrogate posterior of a difference between the log densities. Um, so the gradient is actually similarly expressible as an expectation with an additional gradient term just going into the expectation. So to optimize the KL, I or our strategy will basically be as follows. We'll initialize mu at the MAP estimate from the previous step, and then we'll set an initial small diagonal covariance with a variance of 10 to the minus 6 for each parameter. Um, and then we'll minimize the elbow by approximating the two expressions um, I've shown on the slide using Monte Carlo estimates. So that just means we sample many thetas from the surrogate posterior 
calculate gradients, average, and then update using gradient descent. So the final optimized covariance matrix is an estimate for the true covariance. Um, so for a frequentist interpretation of what's going on here, this can also be understood as taking the Hessian of the log posterior at the mode. Um, so indeed, this actually works pretty well for um, um, just as well as VI for small parameter spaces. But actually, we found in high dimensions, um, the Hessian becomes kind of unstable and that VI is um, significantly more reliable. So we opt to use VI rather than taking the Hessian. So finally, we're prepared to sample. Um, since we have a gradient, uh, since we have gradient information uh, natively using GigaLens, we can use a sampling technique known as Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Um, so this sampler was proposed to handle the inefficiency of MCMC in high dimensions. Um, this inefficiency essentially has its origins in the idea of a typical set. So when we're sampling, we want to spend most of our time in an area known as a typical set, uh, which can be very non-trivial in high dimensions. So it can exhibit some sort of like ring structure as shown on the right. Um, so while MCMC will make a lot of rejected proposals with a structure like this, um, and hence be inefficient, HMC is actually able to use gradient information to follow this typical set very closely, and we get very efficient sampling. Um, so HMC actually requires a couple of hyperparameters and uh, initialization configurations. Um, the first thing is that we initialize the HMC walkers with samples drawn from the surrogate VI posterior from the previous slide. <laughs> And the next point is kind of critical, which is that we set the mass matrix to be the inverse of the covariance matrix. Um, so this is essentially to inform HMC of the various uh, scales associated with each parameter, which can vary significantly for our problem. So some parameters might have a variance of 10 to the minus 3, and some have just 0 0.1. And HMC does not handle this anisotropy well without um, a mass matrix or like a, a set mass matrix to basically inform HMC that you have these different scales. Um, other hyperparameters like the step size and the leapfrog length, those are all adaptively tuned over um, the course of the burden. So to give you an idea of the performance improvements we're able to extract using HMC, we compare it to a popular ensemble sampler in astrophysics known as EMC. Um, so look at the so take a look at the trace plots for the Einstein radius alone. Uh, we can see almost purely independent samples being drawn at every iteration with HMC, um, whereas there's a high degree of correlation. Uh, in EMC. So this is quantified using metrics like the effective sample size, which measures the number of independent samples um, drawn in a sampler. Um, so it's also measured by something called the potential scale reduction factor, R hat, which basically measures what degree to what degree different walkers uh, are sampling from different distributions. So ideally, we want them to look like the top marginal distribution, where all the walkers show very similar distributions. Um, and this leads to an R hat that's as close to one as, as possible. Um, so we see something far less desirable for EMC, where we get an R hat of roughly 1.5. Um, and 1.1 is kind of the standard that um, most people typically reach for. So you can also see uh, a similar degree of performance differences in the effective sample size. So there's almost um, a, two, a two orders of magnitude difference in the effective sample size. So with that, that actually completes our modeling pipeline. Uh, once HMC is done sampling, we've drawn many samples from the posterior, which we can now do inference with. Um, so here I've shown modeling results for one typical system, which is close to an Einstein ring. Um, the corner plot shows the distribution of HMC samples, as well as the VI posterior. So we see the VI actually did a fairly good job of capturing the typical scales of the posterior. Observe like the scale of the Einstein radius is 10 to the minus 3, and gamma is 0 0.07. So we have very different scales here, and VI was actually um, accurately able to capture that. Um, However, VI can't be perfect because we found our posterior is not perfectly Gaussian, despite how it may appear in the corner plot. So for instance, we show a cross-section of the posterior found by slicing along a two-dimensional subspace on the top, where uh, the title says a non-Gaussian um, non parameter cross-section. Um, so we see that our posterior is not perfectly Gaussian because there's um, the, the true posterior is not perfectly Gaussian along this cross-section. Um, so on the right, we've shown a diagnostic for the time breakdown of our modeling. Um, so essentially note that um, VI is actually um, the most expensive part of our modeling when we run on four A100, A100 GPUs uh, on Perlmutter early access. Um, so I'll actually address this later on um, and some ideas for what we have to address this. So now I'm going to show modeling results for four archetypal systems that were uh, simulated. Um, so observe the significant disagreements between VI and HMC here. 
Um, however, it actually still captures the scale roughly accurately, which is all we need. Um, so despite um, despite the uh, in performance of the the v or despite the poor for performance of the VI, um, the reconstructions are still pretty good, and we've basically found an unbiased fit to the observed image. So here are two more systems. Um, the one on the left is known as a cross. So Xiaosheng showed you um, some real observed images known, uh, that exhibit this cross structure. This is a simulated. Um, the one on the right is known as a double. Um, so notably, actually, the VI is almost perfect for the double. Um, so to verify, to verify the correctness of our modeling code, we simulated 100 systems, um, blinded, and then modeled them. Um, and comparing our inferred parameters with the ground truth, we found no bias as well as well ca calibrated uncertainties. So the mean chi-square for each of these is very close to one. Um, so this was actually um, a good test for us to verify the, speed, the speed and the robustness of our code. So finally, I'm actually excited to show modeling results on a real observed systems. Um, what we have here is a classic quad. So you can see um, in the false color, I've indicated the quad configuration in gold. Um, and then there's also a double, which I've shown in the um, silver. So we actually have here two sources being lensed, making it a very interesting system. Um, and we found that GigaLens was actually able to successfully model the system. So take a look at the residual. Um, you'll find that it looks pretty good. OK, awesome. So to wrap up, um, our paper reporting this work um, has been posted on the archive and has also been accepted for publication in the Astrophysical Journal. Um, what next? Well, the first thing we want to do is develop a suite of comprehensive automated tests, as well as improve the documentation for our code. Um, and this goes to our second objective, which is to do a public code release so that we can see um, the interesting results that other people can get um, when using GigaLens. Um, the next thing we want to do is improve the speed of our modeling code by using two GPU nodes. Um, so that means eight GPUs. Uh, and this is actually an option we hope to use, uh, like the configurability option on Perlmutter for. Um, and uh, a sub point of that is to ask, can we eliminate the VI step? And uh, an idea that we have for that is to use mass matrix adaptation for HMC. So uh, we adaptively tune the mass matrix out of, um, the mass matrix over the burn-in steps as well. And the final thing is to apply our code to observe systems from our HST program. Um, so there's two potential goals with this, uh, one being um, subgalactic dark matter halo detection. And the other being uh, using ground-based data, can we model the systems um, spectros spectroscopically confirmed using DESI? Um, so yeah, that about wraps up um, what I have to talk about for modeling. Um, and I'm sure me and Xiaoxiang would be happy to take any questions.